back. My next guest received a personal apology from Taoiseach Leverodka this week, and he has launched a book, a memoir, in which he gives a searingly honest account of the death of his wife during COVID when he was leading the public health response here in Ireland. Would you please welcome Dr. Tony Holohan. Thanks so much for coming on, no, my pleasure. Tony. Uh, this is the book here. Congratulations Thank on you. it. Um, it's very moving. It's very honest. Um, it's called, as we see there, uh, it, We Need to talk. talk. I thought a book by you was going to be about the pandemic and policy and government and all of these things, but I think it's fair to say that um, this is... It's a love story, isn't it? At the heart of it. Yeah, I like that description, yeah, it is. I mean, for me, this was the story of my life. And obviously there were professional issues I was involved in, COVID obviously the most prominent. Uh, but through all of it, the most important thing that was happening in my life was what was happening with my family uh, and Emer, and her diagnosis and the challenge of dealing with that and ultimately in dealing with her death, while at the same time trying to maintain, you know, family life and trying to engage with work and all the challenges that brought. So it so is the story of my life. So take us back, take us back to the start of that love story yeah. and where you met Emer yeah. and how you guys got together. Yeah. Uh, I think you were a bit keener than her at that stage, <laughs> were you? <laughs> yeah, that's saying something, yeah, that's for sure. Um, October 85 was when I started in medical school and I met Emer really in the first week and it's just the kind of chance. She was with another friend, Martha, a great friend of ours who also has sadly died of cancer. We lost both of them within two years of each other, Martha in 2019 and Emer obviously in 2021. And I sat in just by chance behind them, started to talk to them. Uh, and it kind of grew from there. And we became friends quite early on. We had a good friendship uh, over the course of the year and over the course of, I guess, a number of conversations and engagements, I began to feel that maybe there's something more here. And I had a sense that Emer was, you know, you know might, might feel the same. And uh, um, We've all been there. We've all, we've all been there. <laughs> Uh, and at that young age, with very little, I have to be honest, experience in these kinds of matters, uh, I was kind of afraid to make that sort of, that move that you ultimately, I suppose, have to make in order to consummate any relationship uh, and afraid to, to pop any sort of question. So I just let the friendship develop and it really did develop. And we became very close over the course of that first year. Well, the good news is that you did pop the question. You got together. Uh, you had two kids. We did. Uh, Claude and Ronan. Claude and Ronan. I tonight. think they're here tonight. Where are they? Are they in the... The Claude, audience, Claude well, there a, they are. A yellow dress. Give so us a wave. Be, yeah. Yeah. Loving the dress there. There's a, a run in the front. Um, so everything's ticking along. Yes. You guys are um, both doctors. Yes. And in 2012, um, your life changes forever, really, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, Emma was diagnosed in September 2012 with a cancer called multiple myeloma. It was a huge shock to us, obviously. She'd had symptoms going on for a number of months. Uh, she had presented once uh, to casualty in or accident and emergency in maybe the late spring, early summer. We were a little concerned about the pain that she had, but we were reassured. Uh, and then over the course of that summer, she did have a number of further pains. She attended a hospital again and received further reassurance, which I suppose in retrospect is something I have to kind of live with, that uh, although we were concerned and, and sent her to hospital, we were reassured by maybe some of those, those um, a consultation she had in hospital. Sadly, it turned out after a, very shortly after a wonderful family holiday the four of us had in, in, in Lake Garda. She was diagnosed in September of 2012. Uh, initially with cancer, we weren't absolutely certain what the type was. It was confirmed in St. Vincent's that it was multiple myeloma. Uh, and we transferred her care to uh, St. James's Hospital, where the bone marrow transplant unit is. And she was under the wonderful care of the team of doctors and nurses there led by Professor Paul Brown, a most wonderful man who I have the opportunity of saying in the book, and I say it publicly, gave Emer the gift of life by giving her many, many more years than either of us could have expected. We knew as doctors that this was a terminal cancer. We knew that from the beginning. Well, I want to ask you that because, you know, when, when we get news like that, mm -hmm. you know, we wonder, mm -hmm. you know, you're two doctors, you get that news. Is there, is there a shorthand between you guys where you just completely instantaneously know 
where this is going? No, uh, there, there, well, there isn't. We were both public health doctors. We're not close to the specialty of relevance. We, kn we knew about multiple okay. myeloma. We learned about it as students. I remembered my medical school teaching about it. I, I can't recall ever having seen a, a patient with active multiple myeloma because it's not that common. It certainly isn't common in a woman under 50. Uh, so the classic association we had was with somebody maybe in their 70s and 80s. So when, when it was mooted as a possibility, I was saying, that, that can't be. I mean, he was 45, but I discovered that it could be. So of all of the multiple myelomas that occur, about 5% of them will happen in people under the age of 50. So it's not common. And so that's part of the reason, perhaps, why it took some time for the diagnosis to happen. So you're, you're called into Vincent's. Yes. You get the news. Yes. How did you take that news and how did Emer take that news? Well, it was a huge shock, um, the confirmation. Uh, and it came from a friend of ours because we were under the care of Professor Hugh Mulcahy, who happened to be Martha's husband. He had the awful task of sharing with his friends this terrible news that we really weren't prepared for. And it was Emer in that moment who was the person who had the, the strength. I can remember the sense, you know, with her, that the certainty, even though it was awful, was in some way better, easier, more tangible for her to deal with than the uncertainty of what's going on. She said, right, we now know what we have. We know what we've got to deal with. We had a difficult night that Wednesday night, the two of us in St. Vincent's Hospital Same chatting did. about this and planning what we were going to say to Claude and Ronan. Uh, and and we, we planned that together. And there was a practicality in the need for us to do that. And we knew we needed to spend time uh, uh, thinking about that, but we couldn't delay. I mean, it's really important with children that, that we're, you're honest and you're open and you communicate effectively and you're aware of the possibility that they may have suspicions uh, and they may have fears that can be unfounded. So, so we knew we needed to have those conversations. And uh, on that Thursday, we, 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 we had to share the awful news. And I know that both Claude and Ron remember that day uh, very well as, you know, in a way, the worst day of their lives. You said, um, you say a lovely thing in this book. You get the news and you were intent on being Emer's husband, not her doctor. How difficult was that? Um, a little difficult at the beginning. Your instinct is obviously to try to read more, to understand more, to learn more. And as a doctor, I knew how to go after the information, even if I, as I said earlier, didn't fully know all of the details of treatment and prognosis and so on. I went after that. But I, but I quickly realised that the really important thing for me to do was to, 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 to place my trust, not blindly, and for Emer similarly, in the right team of people and give them our support and give them, and then for me to take on the, the job that, I'm the only person who could, could do, which was to be Emer's husband, to be Claude and Ronan's father. Uh, and I knew that was, and I talked quite a bit, a very good friend of mine, Colin Doherty, who's a consultant, he's now head of the medical school in Trinity. We talked at some length about this. He was a great support to me. To find the way of, of, of being, if you like, in the most difficult of circumstances. And there were plenty of doctors, there were plenty of nurses. We have wonderful ones in this country. And we certainly had wonderful ones involved in the care of Emer through many, many years. So I had to, focus on what my job was. And that was doing what many people watching tonight have to go through, and that is to look Absolutely. after someone that they love. And, and you're really honest about it, that whole idea of, you know, you do clash, and yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's, it's yeah. not, you know, here's all the sympathy, thank yeah. you very much, yeah. and, and here's the care. Yeah. It doesn't work like that, does it? Well, life goes on, you know. As we say, sandwiches have to be made, school uniforms have to be ironed, all of that. You, you've got to get on with all that sort of basic duties. For every family, just the ordinariness of that creates its own challenges. With what we had to deal with, with, with Emer's illness, it brings many more challenges. And as things went on and as Emer experienced more symptoms and more pain, and inevitably, unfortunately for her, became more dependent on us and things that we needed to do for her, that did on occasion create challenges. And, and I think it's important that people, you know, understand that that can happen, particularly with a long-standing chronic illness, it can impact on families in all sorts of ways and give themselves, if you like, the permission to not be perfect and their best and responding as they'd always wish to, because it's a long road and it's really difficult. So, Emer's got a prognosis, she's defying the odds. We get mm. to March 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly you are thrown into the spotlight you are in many ways the public face mm -hmm. of the, um, the pandemic here in Ireland. Yes. Um, there's no vaccine. It's no. your policy that is trying to keep people safe. How difficult was it doing your job and knowing that you have someone back home, the person you love more than anybody else, 
who is at high risk for this disease? Well, that, that was very difficult. But what made it easier was I had Emer's full support. We were, she was also a public health doctor, so she'd been through the same training as I had been. So she understood, if you like, the issues, if you like, that were at, that were at hand. And she was a wonderful support to me, and she wanted me to be in the position, and she, she wanted to, to do everything that she could to enable me to do the job that I was able to do. But yes, it was difficult, because we both knew that if you, if you assemble the list of conditions that are most risky for the disease that was COVID, unfortunately, multiple myeloma was at the top. So we lived in fear of Emer possibly picking up multiple myeloma. And, and of course you were going out, you were doing your job, you were coming back yeah. into the house and you yeah. could have been bringing them right back I in. I could, but the biggest risk for Emer is that she had to have necessity continue to go to St. James's on a regular basis for chemotherapy and for other forms of treatment. That was often a weekly uh, event for her. She couldn't avoid the need for that. Uh, and healthcare environments were, were a very risky place for people in terms of picking up transmission. We did have, as we know, many outbreaks, as many, as, as many people will be aware taking place in healthcare settings. So she was always very fearful of, of hospital visits, but they were a necessity in her case. Many people were able to avoid hospital visits, but, but that wasn't a reality for us. So you get to the summer, the summer of 2020, and you have to stand down mm -hmm. um, to look after Emer. Uh, something that is a private family story, yes. then because you're a public figure, yes. that becomes public. And in the book, I, I know you were saying, you know, how hard that was for the family and for Emer. Yes, it was difficult. Um, we'd gotten to a good place as a country. Transmission levels had come down to very, very low levels. We were beginning to look at e a significant easing of restrictions uh, at that point. Uh, but it was difficult for us because perhaps the way in which it was reported, understandably, because it involved Emer going in for a period of time to hospice care. She was written about in the newspapers and, and so on as though she'd already died. And people talked about her in those kinds of terms. I can remember going into a shop with Ronan when those newspapers were there and he was asking me the question, you know, understandably. Uh, but what happened then very, very quickly after that is we, we started to receive, which I really hadn't expected, letters, emails, messages from all sorts of sources and people we didn't know all around the country. And there were messages for Emer of, of love and of support and of admiration for everything that people knew that she must have been doing and supporting me to, in, in the most difficult of circumstances for her. So she became the focus of a lot of that communication. And, it, you know, it, it, perhaps it's hard for people to understand. It certainly was hard for me at the time. I hadn't anticipated it. That was enormously comforting. Uh, I can remember one communication in particular from a nun in a convent in, 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 in Roscommon who'd been diagnosed and she was undergoing treatment by a man who was in primary school with me, Peter O'Gorman, in the Mater Hospital. Uh, and she was writing about how Emer had given her, Emer's story had given her hope in the context of her own illness. And, and those kinds of messages were just wonderful to, to read and to receive. Um, you talk about hope there, but in February 2021, Emer uh, passed away. Um, you guys were, were lucky enough to be with her when she died. We were, yeah. Um, she died in February 2021. She had, we had maybe going back to the end of the previous October into November, she had an admission to the hospice. And really we brought forward a discussion with the medical team and we understood the value perhaps of having such a discussion about the ongoing you know, impact of the treatment, which was taking an increasing toll on her. She was getting radiotherapy, she was getting many forms of chemotherapy and it was increasingly obvious that th these treatments weren't working. And so we prompted the discussion and had a very good engagement with the medical teams and made the decision that ultimately it was better for Emer, even though she could have had some further radiotherapy for, for her to, uh, to come back home with us. Uh, and almost uh, paradoxically, uh, having come home in, in November and she needed to be brought into the house by ambulance and lifted by the, the, the ambulance team onto a chair and she got around the house by wheelchair only for the first couple of weeks. By Christmas, she was walking around the house. She improved paradoxically because she had stopped some of the treatments. And that gave us a wonderful Christmas as a family mm. that, we, that perhaps we hadn't anticipated because we had had, I guess we understood the value of having the conversation, but having the courage to have the conversation in those situations with medical teams is so important about the value of ongoing treatment. And therefore we got a Christmas with her we might not have gotten. Uh, well, well, you say, you know, you got that Christmas that you may not have got and, you know, you were lucky enough to be with her whenever she passed, but the guidelines that you helped form here, um, that meant that the funeral for Emer, it, it wasn't a proper send off. No. Uh, How difficult was that? Uh, that? That was very difficult. Obviously not as difficult as losing her, but we'd had many conversations both with Emer and also with the children in preparation. Uh, and, and 
we knew, the children knew in particular, that this was something that was, that was unavoidable. But it was difficult because we're a very close family, both my family and the Feely family. Family has always been at the centre of our lives and really important to us. Uh, and we couldn't have more than, uh, and with the numbers in our families, it worked well with the 10. We couldn't have more than 10 people there. Uh, and so we had my parents, we had Emer's three siblings, Emer's dad at the time, her mum was unwell, uh, and Claude and Ronan. Uh, and in, in, in the church in which we were married, where Ronan was christened, where Emer was christened, where Emer had all her, 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 her sacraments through school and so on, um, empty, other than us and the priest. And, uh, and, and so many people, so many people went, went, went through that, and, and you're right. You write beautifully about it in, in the book. But, but there were some, it, it led to some wonderful things that wouldn't have happened perhaps otherwise. One I'll pick out, Ronan was in Terranure College. The sixth year boys in his, he was in sixth year at the time, uh, when we came around the corner, we were driving by Terranure College, they were standing on both sides of the road in their full uniforms as we, as we drove by. That was just, you know, incredibly uh, impactful. I mean, it was incredibly impactful. And... You know, the fact that people had to, to find ways of expressing, and that was just a wonderful example. And there were many others, people, all our families and friends standing on roads. Uh, you know, and that had to happen for so many people through COVID. Uh, and it gave us, it, it, that gave us enormous comfort. Um, I want to bring you back to the, the present. The Taoiseach this week um, issued an apology. Um, he said he regretted um, maybe how he, he treated you. How did you feel about that? The apology or...? About that he regretted. Well, well, I, I, I accept what he said, and he said so similarly at the time. Uh, and uh, look, I know the Taoiseach, the current Taoiseach, well. Uh, we worked closely together over many years. I have enormous respect for him. I, th I think he's a wonderful man doing a really difficult job in difficult circumstances. Uh, and I completely accept what he has said and accept the apology. I thought it was important in the context of the story of COVID for us, to be honest about the impact that that had for Emer, because it was really the impact on Emer that, 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 con that concerned me. He, but, he um, you know, he said he had regrets. You mm -hmm. know, when you look back on, on your time, you know, as chief medical officer, do you have any regrets with COVID or cervical smear scandal? Is there, is there anything on that that you look slightly differently on? Well, I think as, as a country in broad terms, if I think about COVID, for example, when we compare ourselves to other countries, if I compare us to, to our nearest neighbours, we did extremely well in terms of measures like excess mortality, our vaccination rates. We had wonderful solidarity across the country. And that happened because everybody in the country, from the Taoiseach right the way down to people in every society and family, got together and, 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 and acted for each other in solidarity because there was a trust in the advice and the guidance. We didn't always know that, that you know, the advice we were given is going to be right. We weren't seeking to be perfect or to be right on every occasion but we, we, we did the best that we could with the information we had at a point in time. Now that we understand more looking back on time, you might do things a little bit differently. And I think we need to find a way of incorporating some of that thinking into, into how we might do things for the future. There's one particular thing that I think is important. Uh, one of the things that COVID really challenged us, challenged us with was scale. We had to vaccinate so many people. We had to, to, to do basic infection control at such a scale, swabbing, uh, testing, and so on. Um, and what really challenged us was to do that volume, if you like, in, in sufficient numbers. We had to then close ex significant health services to, to redeploy staff, to do basic swabbing, to do basic vaccination. I think in the future, we're going to have to find a way of mobilising in society uh, a capacity without us having to close significant tracts of the health service. So I think that's something that I won't say we, we got wrong because we've learned, I think, and we need to find those ways of building resilience into the future. A final thing that you have sure. in the book, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, life gives you, you know, unexpected twists in a good and a bad way. Um, you write in the book about unexpectedly finding love again. Um, how has that experience been for you? Well, it's been wonderful. Um, I, I've met Kira Cronin and, and um, I, I come back to Emer and Kira's with, with me here this evening. I come back to Emer and, and how she enabled that. Emer wrote letters for us. She wrote, left a number of letters. She used to talk to me about the second drawer. Don't forget the second drawer. And she left three letters for me written at different stages and letters for the children. And in the letters she left for me, she addressed the question of me and future relationships and our hopes. And I remember when I phoned her sister Orla to tell her the news about meeting um, Kira, Orla said, you know, Emer spoke to me about that. That's what she wanted for you. 
and I feel lucky and privileged to have had Emer in my life and to, to have met Kira and uh, to have the hope uh, of, of happiness in the future with Kira. Thank you so, so much. Uh, the book is called We Need to Talk, a memoir. Uh, folks, give it up for Tony Holohan. <laughs>